Good morning. New York City Tourism and Conventions, the Tourism Board for New York City, is so pleased to partner with the WTTC, the World Travel and Tourism Council, once again this year at the Nest Climate Campus. Over the past decade, ESG has captured unprecedented attention from stakeholders, especially investors. It's in the news almost daily. The focus on climate change as an urgent existential issue propelled ESG growth, affecting companies across all industry sectors, including travel and tourism. Governments and institutions worldwide are mandating companies to disclose ESG practices and outcomes, shifting from volunteer to mandatory reporting. Europe and US are leading the way, introducing vital new ESG and climate reporting standards coming this year. In the midst of these changes, the World Travel and Tourism Council and consulting firm Oliver Wyman joined forces to produce a groundbreaking new report demystifying ESG requirements for brands across the globe in the travel and the tourism sector. The report provides an ESG readiness roadmap for the industry to understand which regulations will apply to them, to assess their ESG maturity level, and to prepare for the upcoming regulations set to take effect as early as next year. This morning, we bring you a discussion moderated by our friend Arnie Weissman, Editor-in-Chief of Travel Weekly, with experts from global companies, Expedia, Amadeus, Marriott, and Oliver Wyman, who will discuss how travel and tourism can seize the opportunities presented by these future ESG requirements and really lead the sector towards a sustainable future. But first, here's a short video from Julia Simpson, President and CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council. Hello everyone, it's wonderful to be back in New York for this year's Climate Week. This event could not be happening at a more critical time for our global climate action. We're now, as we know, eight years on from the Paris Agreement. Last year in Montreal, we also saw an historic signing of the United Nations Global Biodiversity Framework. So now it's really up to us in travel and tourism to lead the way and become a model for other sectors, the blueprint for how to meet the 1.5 degree target. So thank you all for being part of not just this week, but this journey. We're super grateful to Fred Dixon and the team at New York City Tourism and Conventions. A special welcome and word of thanks to our new partners for this year, Expedia, Oliver Wyman and Amadeus. Thank you so much. And of course, thanks to everyone at the Nest Climate Campus for having us yet again, your iconic venue, a dedicated space where people can come together and spark together and make change is a physical symbol of a much bigger intangible shift that we are seeking all around the world. We have known for a long time that our sector must decarbonize. Moving people around the world, whether in the air, on the water, or on land, is energy intensive, which is why I always say sustainable aviation fuel is critical for governments around the world to prioritize. Decarbonization is not just an airline challenge, it's a challenge for all of us. Until recently, we didn't actually know what the size of our carbon footprint was. Last year, at our global summit in Riyadh, we launched new research into our sector's impact. It covers 185 countries and is one of the largest research projects of its kind ever undertaken. If you can't count something, you can't control it. So quantifying for the very first time tourism's global carbon footprint, as well as things like pollution levels, water use, our impact with our communities is really critical. But what we found actually really surprised us. Today, travel makes up around 8% of total global emissions. And our research found something else. Between 2010 and 2019, our sector's GDP grew at about 4.3% every year. But our carbon emissions increased Hello, Lucas. by it's just 2.4% a year. 
This means that the link between our sector's growth and its carbon footprint has been broken. And in more than 20 countries around the world, emissions have decreased in absolute terms, despite expanding tourism, proving categorically that we can grow and be sustainable. These are signs of progress, but we cannot afford to be complacent. Global temperatures are rising and many species are still threatened. And in response, governments are making structural changes to the way companies disclose information about their environmental, social and governance practices. And tourism is no exception. And travel providers now face new mandatory requirements that will come into effect as early as next year. We thought it was important to support the sector in getting ready. So at the WTTC, we've collated expertise from leaders in ESG and corporate governance around the world to create a single source of guidance for travel and tourism. Now, you might think reporting is one of the least interesting parts of climate change, but it is perhaps the most transformative thing in sustainable tourism. Businesses will need to reorientate the way they think about their operations from the ground up. So for anyone interested, our new report in partnership with our dear partners, Oliver Wyman, is out now. None of us can afford to ignore this agenda. The natural world is our sector's most precious resource and getting to net zero is our most urgent imperative. The new ESG rules are a once in a generation shift. If there is one thing that brings the immense hope, it is events like this. This week, every leader from business, politics, science and activism will be right here in New York. This is where it's happening. And it's up to us to make our voice heard. So thank you all again for your incredible support and I hope you have an inspiring week. Please take time to go onto the wonderful Garden Roof Terrace. It's fabulous, I can assure you. Thank you, one and all. And now, please welcome our moderator for our next session, Editor-in-Chief and EVP Travel Weekly and Executive Vice President, Editorial Director for North Star Travel Group, Arnie Weissman. Good morning, everybody. The pandemic hit the travel industry particularly hard, and the industry is still feeling the impact. While on the one hand, travel boomed this summer, travelers were trying to make up for lost time, the industry is still struggling with staffing shortages, business travel has not come back nearly as to the levels that it was prior, and there, on the other hand, over-tourism has returned as strong as ever. Uh, but on the very positive side, there's never been more awareness of the importance of environmental sustainability, the importance of serving host communities among, among the travel companies. And this comes hand in hand with the rise in ESG. Uh, investors, employees, customers want to know that companies are behaving responsibly. And where previously the reporting was voluntary, Climate change as an ur urgent existential issue has driven both particularly the EU and the US to begin crafting legislation that's going to mandate certain aspects of ESG reporting and these new standards are going to have significant impacts on companies. So as, as Kelly referenced, uh, in the midst of all these changes, the World Travel and Tourism Council and the research firm Oliver Wyman have come together to really help us all better understand the ESG requirements that are about to come. The report is sort of a roadmap for upcoming regulations, and we're going to explore that on our panel today, uh, some of the implications of these. So let me introduce my panelists first. Um, from Oliver Wyman, the research partner for WTTC, the principal in the transportation and services practice, Dan Darcy. From Expedia Group, Aditi Mohapatra, Vice President of Global Social Impact and Sustainability. Applause 
Please welcome Marriott International's Vice President of Sustainability and Supplier Diversity, Denise Naguib. And beaming in from Madrid, uh, the, from the reservation and global distribution system Amadeus, its group environmental officer and head of ESG reporting, Lucas Bobis. Thank you all for joining us today. I know some of you have traveled a bit to get here. Um, I'm going to start with you, Dan. So, in collaboration with WTTC, you've got this comprehensive analysis of propo proposed government regulations. The travel industry is very complex. It's everything from mom and pop businesses to mega multinational corporations. Um, perhaps let's begin with some insights into how the new ESG reporting regulations are going to impact companies of various sizes in various locales and of various levels of sophistication when it comes to um, environmental and sustainability issues. So why don't we start there? Perfect. Thanks, Arnie. Um, as you mentioned, travel and tourism industry is, is very complex. When you think about large, global, multinational companies, uh, hotels, uh, airlines, cruise lines, um, they have operations, many of them, the large ones, have operations all around the world. Um, so they may be subject to, to many different jurisdictions. Um, so we think for those large uh, organizations, there's some urgency here in terms of the upcoming regulations, particularly if they have operations in the European Union. Um, so this is certainly uh, front and center on their agenda uh, with potential reporting required as soon as 2024. For small and medium-sized businesses, which make up about 80% of the travel and tourism industry, it could be a little bit longer um, in terms of that, those specific requirements. That being said, what uh, a lot of the focus is on for those organizations is if they're suppliers or value chain partners with some of those large companies that are required to uh, disclose their scope three emissions, they're gonna be getting asked for that data as a supplier of one of those reporting companies. So I think uh, for some of those small, medium-sized enterprises, some of the disclosure requirements might be coming sooner than they expect. Okay, and, and just to clarify, uh, scope three has to do with the supply chain. In other words, ensuring that the people who give you what you don't own are also uh, following your standards. Exactly, and, and one challenge that we heard from the travel and tourism members, the WTTC members that we talked to, was there are many shared suppliers among the big travel and tourism organizations. So the fear is that each of these small suppliers is gonna be asked for many different uh, types of data from these different partners. Um, and if there's a way to standardize that, that would make it a lot easier for smaller organizations that don't have uh, p potentially the resources that the larger companies do. So for a large international company, would it make sense for them to look at what are the most demanding requirements, sort of tailor their ESG protocols around that? Um, but it's very possible, I would imagine, that the American and European uh, regulations are going to have some significant differences. What is what is what have you learned so far about those two uh, jurisdictions, which are going to have the biggest impact? Definitely, I would say generally um, there is a lot of overlap amongst the the frameworks that are being uh, developed and that are are, are being finalized. Um, when you think about uh, ESRS in the European Union, uh, the SEC rules within the U.S and then ISSB internationally, which is gonna be tailored to each individual uh, jurisdiction, they're all uh, built upon the platform of TCFD. So in and of itself. To, <laughs> you're gonna have to fill in some of these letters. I've been following you pretty, until you got to that. Perfect, perfect. I'll, I'll keep it broader. The, the European Union rules, the US rules uh, from the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the international rules. Um, those are really the three areas that we looked at within the report. Um, and they're all really established on TCFD, which was a voluntary reporting framework that was established, uh, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, so that is really, because that's the foundation for many of these new frameworks, um, there's a lot of similarities already embedded in them. Now what we have heard uh, with some of the uncertainty in the United States around the SEC rule, what we have heard from some of the members 
even if they're US based, they might be multinational with some operations in Europe and internationally, they are looking at the EU rules and potentially even complying with those rules despite them being the most strict to give them some certainty and recognizing that the US rules and other international rules will probably not be as strict and there will be that interoperability between them. Yeah, and Aditi is, is Expedia Group sort of following that path. How are you preparing? Yeah, well, thank you, first of all, for having me here. Uh, a lot, a lot is happening across the business to get ready. I mean, there is uh, no doubt <clears throat> a lot of complexity in, in what was just, you know, described in, in the alphabet soup of, of, uh, of ESG reporting. And so we're doing a number of things to kind of get ready. I think just to start, you know, I mean, it is an interesting place to be in where now kind of compliance is, compliance is usually viewed as like the bare minimum. And now compliance is kind of raising the bar on what we have to get done, which is just like a whole new era for, for ESG reporting. Um, they're, they're very intense requirements, right? And they're gonna be very expansive. They need to be audited, they need to be assured. Um, and so it's going to take a lot. It's gonna take a, a large effort to kind of come into compliance with those. So we're doing a number of things to get ready. We've established internal governance structures and processes that help us kind of get going to make sure we have the right oversight, we have the right partnership across the business to be able to meet the demands that are being set out. We're also putting in place, um, we're also reviewing kind of the current data sets that we collect and the quality with which we collect them. Again, these are gonna to need to be in independently assured. Um, and so we need to raise the bar on all of that as well. So um, when you move out of voluntary space where we've been reporting for a long time into a regulatory space, there's obviously just kind of a depth and professionalism around that data that needs to improve as well. And then we are putting in place, we've done a number of new processes to get ready as well. So we've completed our climate risk assessment, which informs that TCFD um, reporting that Dan just spoke about. We've um, put together our first ever climate action plan that will be released soon, which describes kind of our approach to the issues of climate change and our strategies in this space. Um, and we've just, yeah, taken a number of different efforts to really start getting going. Yeah. Uh, and Lucas, I want to reassure you, we remember you're here. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Denise with one question, then I'll, I'll come back to you. So, uh, Denise, the ESG standards are being written for all industries, not just for, for travel and tourism, but even within a single industry like travel, the, there are sectors that behave very, very differently. You know, if you run an airline versus a hotel company like Marriott, you may both have a reservation system, you may have loyalty programs, but everything else can be very, very different. So do you anticipate that, for instance, among the hospitality industry, there's just going to be a lot of sharing of practices and guidance, uh, or is it possible that ESG could be one of those areas that if you have a system that is superior to others, it kind of gives you a competitive advantage even? Um, I, I th thank you so much, first of all, for having me. Um, I not only anticipate, but we've been at it for over a decade as an industry, hospitality, to work together and create these methodologies so that we can all be working towards the same goal and competing on the back end. Trust me when I say we're very competitive still, but working on the front end to make sure that we're all doing the math in the same way is critical. And in uh, 2011, uh, we came together as an, uh, a group under what is now the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance to develop a series of methodologies to calculate carbon footprint together and, and using that same math, water footprint, and most recently for waste. So those are three really important ways by which we as an industry have created this together based on what we know about our business. We have put it out in a public domain so that others can use it. So that small medium business uh, group of 80% that make up 80% can also tap into the same methodologies. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then that way we can create the way that we can communicate back to our travelers that those data points in a consistent manner. So as a traveler, you know when you're getting the data from us or from one of our competitors, you are doing so in a way, uh, understanding that there's a 
comparability um, factor there. So that's a really important step that we took a very long time ago um, and continue to modify and improve things as we need to, but that was foundational to what we've been doing for the last decade. Wow. And again, we compete on the, the outcome, the metric on the other end, and uh, again, using that uh, clarity in the process, we can communicate to our customers that you can compare these data points. There are a lot of nuances, obviously, if you're looking at a carbon footprint of a hotel in a certain market, it's gonna look different uh, in, in other markets based on where that energy is coming from. But ultimately, is the starting point. We've also come together and created a pathway for net positive hospitality, and that really is, again, guidance for where do you even start, how do you take yourself on the journey, how do you make sure that you're not jumping to you know, doing, taking major action before you even have that foundational understanding of where you are? And so I think from a hospitality perspective, we, we've been collaborating a long time on this, and I think there are continually opportunities to do more collaboration. But what I've heard from my, some of my colleagues in the airlines is that they were you know, pretty impressed with hospitality had been doing this for a while and then started to have conversations amongst themselves again of how they should be tackling this. So I think it's a model that can be really looked at. Um, we absolutely all need to win and so I think the competition is really important but we also don't need to have 18 million ways to do something. And overarchingly, I mean, some of the, the topics that uh, Dan brought forward, the methodologies on how you collect this, these emissions for the industry, for your company, are very set in stone. Greenhouse gas protocols have been around for a long time. They're used by, I think, 99% of companies that do their disclosures. So it's not like we're reinventing the way that we do it. We're just taking those insights and really creating a sector-specific approach for ultimately you as a consumer to be able to leverage. Is, is that data that you've been putting together as an alliance uh, aggregated and open to the public to see? Great question, and yes. So if you go to a website called hotelfootprints.org, you can see not by individual hotel, but for each city, what the range is by type of hotel. So you know, luxury hotel in New York City is gonna have a different range of carbon footprint than a, a, a select hotel. And so those data sets are available. You can do you know, um, estimated calculations if you want before you go to a place or if you're hosting a meeting, you can put in some parameters and get um, based on the average data for the sector. Um, and then individual companies are doing different things. For us at Marriott, on, on the Marriott.com site for each individual hotel, you can see the carbon and the water footprint for each of the hotels individually. So if you go on there and it's validated data, you'll be able to see that metric and use that as a comparison point. Um, so other companies may be doing something similar. But ultimately, we're trying to put that out there transparently so that, again, the travelers can have a data point that matters to them. It's a lot easier to say, oh, my carbon footprint is X per room night than to have this massive number of what is, you know, my com our company's scope one, two, and three. Like, that doesn't make sense for the individual. Yeah, I would imagine that uh, ultimately either a research company or consumer group might look, if you're not having it aggregated on that website, at your individual sites and begin to see some rankings. I exactly, yeah. yeah. Especially with all these new details that will be coming out. Lucas, mm -hmm. hola, how are you? <laughs> hola, <laughs> I'm uh, well, very pleased to, to join the, uh, the panel, even if uh, remotely from Madrid. So yeah, very, very much uh, happy to, to join you. So uh, Amadeus, and for those of you who may not know Amadeus, is started out as just a reservation system, has grown to be a huge, maybe the largest in the world, consulting organization to the travel industry. It still has its reservation components, but has added layers using the data that they can and the insights they have, they have expanded uh, pretty significantly. Was that a pretty good summation of Amadeus? Thank you, Arnie. I think it was it was definitely yeah. We have uh, diversified, especially to the IT sector, a few years ago, and that's also a fundamental component of a sustainability value proposition, as we like to call it. Yeah. So you're aiming to be carbon neutral in 2025. Uh, has your review of the proposed ESG regulations sparked any ideas about what next? Because carbon neutral is already a pretty pretty good uh, hurdle to overcome. But so, what? Where do you think you're going from there? Well, I think that the uh, incoming uh, regulation, especially I would say after the pandemic, uh, has uh, shifted completely the point of view uh, in which we are looking at these things in the industry, you know, from all stakeholders, from things that were a few years ago, especially in direct emissions, uh, scope three emissions, 
uh, nice to have are becoming mandatory either legally or because of the expectations of our different stakeholders. So, so definitely this has pushed us uh, to take more firm commitments uh, like, uh, uh, well, we have recently, uh, we are working on a plan to commit to a science-based target initiative and expect to be, uh, to be validated uh, next year. Uh, and uh, it is, it is uh, I mean, the new regulation, particularly the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, I will avoid the acronym, <laughs> is, is a new piece of regulation that I think is what Dan was referring to that is going to be implemented, enforced in, for the 2024 reporting. And I think that it, it makes an important change. And it is not only requesting pieces of information in the form of KPIs, but it's also requiring documented plans about what is going to be the strategy, for example, to mitigate uh, the uh, emissions released uh, by the company and our value chain. I would also like to add that we, the, the regulations are not only sparking ideas, but I would say also suggestions. And uh, following on from the presentation uh, before from Ms. Brovas Cioti on social justice, I think uh, some of these principles can be also applied to climate change in particular, particularly uh, those are that idea that those that are closer to the problem are also closer to the solution. Uh, we perceive, in our particular case, and I think this is due in, in part because let's say that our direct impact in terms of emissions is relatively small compared to those all uh, stakeholders with which we work, uh, particularly airlines. And also following on from what uh, Julia said, the challenge of decarbonization is not only from airlines. We have to be involved in that and we have to do our job to help them achieve that objective. No? And so what, I'm, what we are missing a little bit in the regulation is that uh, we are perceived, in, in, in my opinion, in many respects, as a source of problems. You, know, you have to report how much emissions do you release as a consequence of your burning of fuel, how much emissions are released in your data processing in our case, uh, delivering the solutions, but uh, I think we should entertain a discussion also about what is the solution that we are bringing. I mean, just to give you a more visual example, I'm sure most, if not all, uh, of the uh, attendees in the audience have been experiencing a thing, uh, a, a, a large airports like the AFK situations in which you are stranded in an aircraft uh, waiting to take off simply because there is a large queue of aircraft. I would like the U.S. regulators to come up to me and say, well, you are a technology company. Are you not able to solve this? And if you are, what can be done to do it? Because we do have some solutions for that particular problem that is very visible and others. And I think we are missing that component to large extent. Thank you. And uh, Dan, the regulations, my understanding, is that they are one set for all industries. Is that correct? So can you imagine that they will begin after this has been established to start setting perhaps additional requirements for different industrial sectors so that travel and tourism might have some reporting that is not uh, in, in a mining company? Definitely. I think uh, as we start out, most of it will be, will be general uh, in terms of what the travel and tourism industry will have to comply with. Um, they have hinted at uh, additional sector-specific uh, requirements. So, for example, uh, the international requirements, the ISSB, um, they've already hinted at specific and, and recommend uh, for the airline industry, the cruise line industry, and hotels, uh, industry-specific metrics that they'll be recommending disclosure of. Now, what's interesting about the, the international rules is uh, it's a recommendation and individual countries can decide how to implement them and how to actually apply them within their own borders. Um, so I think there'll be a question there to understand, will that recommendation be included for a specific country or will that country potentially go even further where there might be, uh, if you look at a country like Costa Rica uh, or uh, Bhutan or Thailand where the tourism industry is a very large portion of the, uh, of the GDP of the country, um, would they potentially go further than what the recommendations are in that specific sector? So potentially all 192 member states of the <laughs> UN could each have their own requirement, which would only apply if you do business in that uh, thing. Now, one of the things, of course, when the internet became regulated in terms of privacy, even though 
of a company might be based uh, outside of Europe, if their website was accessible within Europe, then they still had to. So do you imagine that if someone's website mm -hmm. is available in 190 countries, uh, that they are going to have to keep an eye on every one of those countries' regulations? Um, I think at, at a high level, um, most most of what we're talking about will be interoperable. Where I think I think maybe there will be some edge cases, um, and something that we are hearing is that there are, especially for the large corporations that have those tentacles. I wouldn't say websites, but certainly boots on the ground, employees, revenue generated <coughs> in a specific country. Um, it is important to continue to monitor uh, the status and what those specific rules might look like. And do you anticipate that it might go beyond what it's doing into the point of even social issues, where they might say, all of this profit, there's so much leakage, mm -hmm. you need to, if you want to be in our country, return or take out only X percent? Do you anticipate this sort of thing? There's definitely, um, as we look, I mean, when you look at the rules as they are today, it's very focused on environmental. Um, but as they look at phasing these in and what the next steps are, certainly social issues, governance, the other factors for ESG, uh, and even biodiversity, where you look at uh, what was TCFD, the Task Force for Climate-Related uh, Financial Disclosures. Now they've set up TNFD, kind of within the same framework, the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. I think there is a question of how does this evolve over time? We're very focused on environmental right now, um, there is you know, very similar industry-wide when you look at the different frameworks, there's a lot of interoperability around them, but that is gonna evolve as it gets implemented and as, that reach, as it reaches more organizations and not just the large multinational companies. No. So, uh, Lucas, you know, uh, most surveys that I've seen conclude that only a, a minority of travelers will pay a higher price to have a sustainable trip. I know your company uses the International Civil Aviation Organization's carbon calculator on your distribution platforms to inform customers during the booking process about the greenhouse gas emissions that they might release during the trip and how they can compensate for them. Can you perhaps, through the bookings that go through your system, measure the effectiveness of this tool and whether it's had any impact on uh, increasing sustainable travel? Well, as, as you mentioned, as, uh, it's true that all the surveys, and actually we see that in practice, uh, it is hard to see uh, the volumes that we would want of customers that uh, will be ready to pay for sustainable travel. And uh, so we have to wonder why that is happening and how can we change that? And I think that we can look at easily two main reasons. One is that maybe they are expecting uh, some other player in the industry to, to do that for them. Uh, maybe it can be the travel provider, it can be someone else. Uh, but there is an important component, and I think Denise touched on it uh, before, which is clarity, you know, and, uh, and transparency of the information. I mean, just to illustrate it a little bit, when you are trying to make a booking for yourself, okay, you look at fundamental pieces of information to make a choice, which is the schedules, the availability of the, the, the flight, uh, and also the, the fare. No? The, all of these pieces of information are sort of unquestionable and very much straightforward. But if you want to choose sustainability as another factor to make your choice, then it becomes much more difficult because you have to say, okay, what I, what, how do I consider sustainability? Do I refer to CO2 emissions alone? And if I do that, how do I calculate that? especially if I am making a booking three months in advance when I don't even know what aircraft is going to fly, probably. So it becomes very, very uh, a difficult topic, unfortunately, and that is why uh, we wanted to, uh, uh, first of all, reach a level of precision uh, that this can be uh, acceptable. But once that is reached, I think we are in a situation now in which consensus is much more important than uh, hitting the exact figure. And uh, I, I think in, in, the, in the hospitality sector, Denise explained it very well, the initiative from SHA, I think, is brilliant. And we are trying to do the same in the aviation sector. We have actually joined forces with other players in the, in this, in the industry, uh, in, uh, with Expedia, for example, joining the Travelist Coalition, that I think is the first, in, is the first uh, initiative in the world that gathers uh, 
number of uh, players in the industry with the same objective of providing a common framework to bring transparency to the traveler. Um, and also in a, in a sort of what they call pre-competitive uh, uh, manner, no? uh, so that we join forces with our competitors even in that effort. So that area of bringing clarity, not only about uh, reporting the emissions, but also giving options about which option is better, and also doing it in a consistent and homogeneous manner, regardless of what channel of distribution you use, I think it's an effort where we need to work more on our side if we want to see those figures in the service and in reality to go up. To go up. Thank you. Uh, Denise, in, in light of the increasing frequency of uh, and intensity of climate-related events, how is Marriott managing climate risks such as extreme weather events, sea level rise, um, and if have you noticed that this has had an a impact on bookings. For instance, are people less likely to book Florida and the Caribbean during the hurricane season or uh, perhaps avoid Canada during a dry season for a fear of wildfires? Yeah, great question. So I think one of the things that's really interesting um, is we have done a uh, climate risk assessment of, of our hotels, starting with the US and Canada, which is our largest footprint. Um, we, we don't own our assets. We own you know, a few dozen of the 8,700 plus hotels. And so the impacts are really uh, greatest to our owners. And so part of the process that we went through to do these evaluations was to have information to share back with our owners, to let them know this is what the issues may be in your particular uh, situation. What are some of the ways that maybe they can be considered as they're trying to do some of the renovations or you know, thinking about um, what should they be doing to try to build in resiliency. Climate change is here. We know the impacts are already having um, you know, a lot of extreme damage to, to assets. And it's really important that the hotels and others that have those assets on the ground are addressing that resiliency piece first um, because it's, you know, the mitigation stuff is also happening, but you know, they're, they're feeling it today. So one of the things I think are, are not yet visible is the, what does that mean for the traveler? I don't know that most people really have a great sense of, oh, this is a higher risk versus a lower risk unless something happens. So I was just talking to some of our general managers in Greece and they have felt, for example, this summer, a, an impact to their own uh, business because of the fires, even in places where the fires haven't anywhere come to near touching. But that concept of people feel that there's a risk there and therefore are making a different decision, especially if they don't necessarily have to go there, right? They may say, okay, well, I was gonna go to Greece, but maybe I'll go to Italy instead, or something you know, that they can make a, a switch if they haven't already committed to that. So I think it's starting to come up in some of those um, ideas because absolutely, I mean, how many of us would be like, yeah, I'm gonna run into the fire? No, right, you don't make that decision if you can choose otherwise. So I think as more, these become more frequent, as these impacts are greatest in certain locations, I am sure our industry is going to start feeling that. Um, either people traveling at different times or people traveling to different places because of those potential um, impacts. And part of it is it has a, a little bit of a long tail. It could have, a hurricane could have hit somewhere five years ago and that may still be stuck. Oh, that place was damaged by a hurricane, therefore it's not ready to receive me. So there might be a little bit of sort of that, you know, um, response to something that happened a long time ago. But I think, again, given the growth in these um, impacts throughout, we are absolutely, as an industry, going to continue to feel that. How much uh, influence do you have with an owner in the sense of you see something, because they represent your brand, yeah. they are the face of your brand even though they uh, aren't, they are o the owners and not managers. So if you see something that you feel is you know, going the wrong way, for any number on these ESG things. Can you put pressure to the point of enforcing that things change or do you have to just suggest? We have, we have some um, sticks, if, we, if you call it right, in terms of that. One of the biggest things is for us is that we, we require all of our hotels to disclose information so that we can gather this data on their carbon footprint, their water footprint, their environmental practices 
the, the carrot associated with that and is that the top line revenue piece. So for over a decade, the Global Business Travel Association has had a centralized set of questions in the RFP that over 5,000 of our RFPs include um, around sustainability. What we tell our owners is responding to these questions in our centralized system makes it so that you have a seat at the table when these RFPs come in. You don't do what we're asking of you, you can't get in front of these questions um, that come through on the RFP because it's, you can't just answer them independently. They have to be validated through our process, including, like I said, the carbon and water data because it has to go through some math. And so that's a little bit of the, the carrot for the ownership group is whether you believe in what's going on, whether you're bought in, whether you want to invest, the end of game is that this information is already visible to our customers. So you have a choice if you want that um, to be able to compete for that business. You play the game, you do what needs to be done, you enter your information and so on. And that's where I think we're gonna start seeing a little bit more of the competitiveness to drive some of those behavior changes. We do um, have in a process to embed more and more sustainability into the design standards. That's where we have the biggest opportunity with the owners on the very front end, right? As long as we are saying, yes, you can build a hotel and with our brands, you are building it to certain specifications, right? And so we are embedding it so that on that front end piece, you're already receiving sort of some more sustainability attributes built in because once it's built, you know, th those are not um, things we can change very easily, right? And so some of these things are sort of being infused um, and some of them are being suggested. Um, one thing in, in, as we've rolled out, we just uh, finalized our submission to science-based target and we will be providing individual hotels and thereby owners the guidance on how to tackle these issues. We, we have very different scales of owners. We have owners that are real estate investment trusts and they've got support mechanisms behind them to look at things in a very granular way. We have others that literally are individuals like us who own a hotel. And so we really need to make sure that we're also providing that guidance to the variety of owners that we have so that they can really do something about it because it is absolutely going to be a partnership as Dan was talking about before with the suppliers, all of us, the entire ecosystem needs to work together to try to solve some of these challenges. It's not just one part of the system. Thank you. So Aditi, uh, Expedia Group's operations have been carbon neutral since 2017. You purchased renewable energy equivalent to 100% of your global office consumption in 2021. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so what areas still need work? Yeah, so um, we've been proud of the efforts that we've made to date, and we're really excited to be able to announce that we are setting our own net zero goal for our operations, um, where we will be net zero by 2040. We're committing to that. We're also committing to the Science-Based Targets Initiative, and we'll be setting um, near-term reduction goals for scope one and scope two, 75% by 2030, and then working with our suppliers as well to commit to the Science-Based Targets Initiative as well. So we're really excited to be able to move kind of forward on our journey from carbon neutral into a space of decarbonization where we're really taking kind of more direct action across um, our operations. That sounds good. <laughs> so. Uh, Dan, is the report that Oliver Wyman has produced with WTTC available to the public? And if so, how can people get, get a look at it? Definitely. So it will be. And, and first of all, uh, a huge thank you to Denise, Aditi, and, and Lucas, uh, and all the WTTC members and, and the partnership with WTTC itself. It's been really exciting to talk to a lot of members across all the many industries within travel and tourism. Uh, and to see the engagement and the excitement uh, about uh, the folks that, that we've talked to who are really, really interested in moving the industry forward uh, and, and meeting these, these sustainability challenges. Um, the report is coming out, so we're, we're kind of uh, giving, giving a, a, te a few teasers. Um, we're gonna be releasing a number of reports that are gonna be sharing the insights uh, from the report, and then the full report we're expecting to come out uh, alongside COP28 uh, and the WTTC Global Summit, which is coming up in early November. Um, so you can find all that information on World Travel and Tourism Council's website, WTTC, as well as Oliver Wyman's, and that will also be in, in publications as well, and it'll all be publicly available. All right. Well, thank you all. I've got, like, pages more questions. <laughs> it was uh, really interesting, you know, when you talk about regulations, you never know how dry it's going to be. <laughs> And you all have made it uh, very interesting and understandable and relatable. 
and actually I'm really interested in, in looking at how this will roll out. It sounds like it's going to be smooth, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you never know. So thank you very much, ladies Thanks, and Sarge. gentlemen. Thank you. Please. All.